Brandon for reading scripture for us today. Now, lately we've been talking about the journeys of various disciples and then starting Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we talked about Jesus' own journey to the cross. And as I, as I pondered what to look at next in, in church and take some time with, uh, it dawned on me that maybe it's time we look at a very significant journey. Probably one of the most significant journeys in, in Scripture, namely the journey of a nation out of slavery in Egypt. Uh, part of this also comes from the fact that earlier than the, in the year, I was able to attend a preaching seminar, and the, the book of focus was the book of Exodus. And it was rich and deep. And there's so much value and so much to find in this, in this book. And maybe we're, we're familiar with movies like the Ten Commandments or, or something like that, that that's kind of superseded maybe even our, our knowledge of what Scripture itself teaches us. But I, there's value to, to looking at these Old Testament Scriptures because they're not just stories in the past that have nothing to do for us. These were the Scriptures that Jesus himself called Scripture when he walked this earth. These are the passages that taught the nation what it means to be a people of God. And so it very much does have something in store for us. This book is very full and very rich with theological treasures that I want us to start to dive into this morning and in the coming weeks. So before we begin, let me explain what I want us to do in this series of messages. Now, first of all, I want to caution us about an approach that maybe is tempting to take with Scripture. We start with Scripture text on the, on the bottom of the screen there, and we want to jump straight to our lives. Now, looking at it on the back of the screen, it looks like my little red X, like no sign, uh, seems to be a little bit darker than I intended. So let's get rid of that. Uh, instead, we want to look at something. We want to think about how that text was intended. Who wrote the book of Exodus? We commonly attribute it to Moses. Why did Moses write the book of Exodus? He had an original audience in mind. He wrote the book for a reason, to a people for a reason. I want you to think about that. This will come up as, as we go through the text. But as Moses was in the wilderness with this nation in their Exodus process, he wanted to make sure that future generations would know the stories. And so the book of Exodus, the original text, was written for an original audience for a purpose. From that, now we need to start thinking as Christians, because th this, this is for us, but there's another step I want us to take first. Namely, how does what we're looking at point to Jesus? Is Jesus explicitly in the text? Is, is a promised Messiah implied? Is there hints at it? Is it a prophecy about it? Another way of looking at it is, does the New Testament actually quote anything of what we're looking at? Because that can be an important part of how the text relates to Jesus. It's for good reason that the book of John introduces Jesus as in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very clearly saying Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is this in our hands. These passages passed down to us. And again, I point to the fact that for John, as he wrote the Gospel, there was no New Testament as we have it. He would have said the Word intending these passages, like the book of Exodus. Then, from Jesus, now we bring it into our context. What do we learn from it? So as much as we can go Scripture straight to us, and there can be some good things, the better, fuller way to properly digest this is to consider the original, con the original context, the original audience, how that points to Jesus, and then from Jesus, what can we learn from it for our lives? That's the process I want us to strive to learn as we go through these, these passages. So, how does Exodus teach us about how to live our lives? How does Exodus point to Jesus? Well, the first chapter of 
what the first chapter of Exodus does for us is it introduces us to a recurring problem. What does the world do about the people of God? This introductory chapter of the book of Exodus reveals to us that there is evil in the world. I mean, we kind of know that instinctually. But as Moses sat down to write this book, he wanted to outline some very specific things. There is evil in the world. It also begins to illustrate for us that God is good, even though if you look at the whole first chapter, all of chapter 1, and you look for where God is mentioned, it talks about some people fearing God, but it doesn't actually say God was doing a thing. It's implied. It's there, but you, it's, not, it's not explicit. It's not specifically spelled out for us. And so God is doing something. God is good, even though the book doesn't explicitly talk about him. It also introduces us to the theme of deliverance that is woven throughout not just the book of Exodus, but the Bible as a whole and nation, Israel's history as a nation. So deliverance, deliverer, again, we're starting to hear promises of a Messiah, hints at Jesus. See, there was a growing problem in Egypt, and, and Pharaoh thought that it was this people group, the Israelites. He thought their numbers were growing too large and feared for his own political power should they ever decide to overthrow him or side with their enemies. And ultimately, though, the real problem that was growing in Egypt was the evil in the land. An evil that took strong root in the heart of Pharaoh, but was also present in the Egyptians as well. And this problem is one that we suffer with, because we know it to truly be sin. Sin grows and creates additional problems. And so what is the solution? Let's start things off. Exodus 1, 1 through 10. I, I do want to read through these again, even though they were read for us earlier. Um, these are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, even with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now, this is what was read for us earlier, but again, now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So first of all, I want to note that the introductory verses of the book of Exodus do a few things for us, some of which are lost on us due to translation. So first of all, the name of the book of Exodus, we get the name because it is the story of their Exodus journey, this, this journey they went. But that's, how do you name a book? The author didn't name it, he just wrote the book. Hebrew tradition for naming books is to take the first few words. What are the first few words of the book of Exodus? These are the names. That, that's according to Hebrew tradition, that's the name of the book of Exodus. These are the names. It's the book of names. Now, this is actually something I want us to pay attention to because it's really interesting. And it is something we don't necessarily pay attention to. Look at who is named. Look at what is named. This even comes up in chapter 1 that we're looking at today, but throughout the whole book. Who and what is named, who and what is not. But there's even a little bit of controversy in terms of those first few words. These are the names. The controversy is that the first word is actually the word and. And these are the names. Now, I don't know about you, but I kind of remember my English class days in high school. Did any of our teachers like us to start our sentences with the word and? Not so much, right? Because it, it can kind of make for awkward things. But what does that do? And is a connecting word. So why would the book of Exodus start with a connecting word? What does it connect to? Well, 
what came before it. That means Exodus has to be understood in the context of Genesis as well. Exodus is a logical extension. How did it start? It started by talking about where Genesis ended. Joseph, Jacob's sons, and this immigration into Egypt. It's the follow-up on what, on what Genesis just ended on. So we have to understand it. And it's really interesting to pay attention to where hints are at what Genesis talks about. So look at things like fruitfulness and multiplication. Look at, look at the patriarchs, whenever they're mentioned, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, these are, these are going to be important things as we work our way through the book. It's really fascinating. All right. We are introduced to a new pharaoh who doesn't care about the history that Israel has with Egypt. The fact that Joseph was involved in their deliverance from a severe drought. Joseph didn't matter to him. Now whether this king was just ignorant of him and didn't know or didn't care. That can be debated, but it really doesn't change anything. This Pharaoh was pragmatic. That means he was thinking about how things worked and how to make things work the best for his own interests and maybe the interests of his own people. There was a practical problem with this budding and burgeoning uh, nation that was growing within their borders because the sons of Israel had multiplied. Seventy started... They immigrated into Egypt way back when, and now they had grown to a very numerous people to the point where this king was concerned that they might overthrow the Egyptians. Pharaoh's problem is that the nation was growing too big, but the actual problem was far more dangerous. You see, something was growing. It was sin. Sin was growing in the nation. This is the story of the birth of Egyptian racism towards the Jewish people. And it is here that we begin to catch a glimpse of a far greater problem that will eventually point to the cross. And Jesus as the ultimate solution for the ultimate problem. But in Pharaoh's eyes, the growing population is a growing problem. And as the king, he needs to do something about it. So what does he do? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that he is all that creative, nor is he a good man. So his first solution is slavery. Verses 11 through 14. This is the remainder of what Brandon read for us earlier. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields and in all their harsh labor for the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So I, I suppose, like, logically thinking, this is probably the first thing we start to do with people we don't like, right? We start to treat them less kindly. We start to mistreat them. For a king and a people group, and I guess it was the same thing in this instance. Pharaoh treated them poorly. He made them slaves of the nation. They were there because of circumstances regarding a, a severe drought 400 years prior, but now the Egyptians were beginning to become cautious of this multiplication. Right? They began to treat them harshly in order to benefit from their presence. And cities were built. They pushed them into forced labor. Now, theme of names. Book of names. What is named? The Israelites built two store cities. Python and Ramses, right? Interesting. Why were these cities named? Have you noticed something though? Someone isn't named. Who has noticed the name of this king? The book of names, Pharaoh is unnamed. And yet the nation of Israel has built two store cities that are named. Interesting. Keep, keep that in mind. This cruel king remains unnamed. Connecting Exodus to Genesis is this notion that the people are fruitful and multiplying. Genesis 1.28, what was God's command to Adam and Eve? Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The nation of Israel is actually fulfilling their God-given command to be fruitful and multiply, to go forth and and subdue the, the, the ground. But Pharaoh sees it as a problem. The measures that he is take, taking, mistreating them, putting them into slavery, it's actually backfired on his plan to control the population. As he oppressed them, they multiplied more. Interesting. As this king sought to undermine God's command to be fruitful and multiply, God blessed the nation that was being oppressed by making them fruitful and multiply. But their multiplication took this fear of the king and it actually kind of made it commonplace among the whole people. The Egyptians started to fear the numbers that they were seeing amongst the Israelites as well. And notice the use, and I think Moses does this intentionally, notice the use of that word ruthlessly. It comes up a couple of times. This isn't just like, oh, they, they weren't invited for dinner. No, they, this is, they, were, they were intentionally mistreated. They were forced into labor. They had to, by the sweat of their backs and and brows, build these store cities and do hard labor. But this problem that the king sees is persisting, and so he needs another means of reducing their population. And so his second measure is selective murder. Verses 15 through 21. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shifra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew woman during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? Now, I have a hard time reading this next part without a bit of tongue-in-cheek. The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. So Pharaoh's measure to reduce the population was essentially selective abortion. Murdering sons. And he commissioned these Hebrew midwives. And again, what do we have there? We have their names. The unnamed king in the book of names commissions Hebrew midwives to murder the boys. Shifra and Pua. but they don't. It says they fear God. And it is more important to fear God than to fear the political leaders. That is significant. and It needs to be a part of our character. And I believe part of the reason why they're named is because of that. And God honored them. And how did God bless them for what they did? Stemming back to Genesis 1, 28. Gave them families. They went forth and multiplied. Very interesting. Now I I think about this, and and I want you to remember that map that we drew of the text to the original audience, to Jesus, to us. The text was written to the original audience. Who was the original audience? It would have been, what, one or two generations down from this, right? Is it possible that Moses wrote this, and as they read this out to the crowds, that some of the people gathered there would have nudged and said, that's my grandma. Right? This is the story of how this nation came out of Egypt, and it started with this, and we have named women being hailed as heroes. They had families, children, and those children likely would have been part of what left Egypt. And as the story was recounted, 
families would have said, that's, that's my blood, that's my family, that's my story. The original intended audience was the children and grandchildren, maybe even another generation down from Shifra and Pua. Pointing to Jesus, it's important for us to consider the kind of people that God would use to bring Jesus into the historical timeline and to demonstrate that faithfulness, such as unwillingness to perform an evil deed, was rewarded for their behavior and encouraged for future generations. Be faithful and true. Fear God more than humankind. Something else to consider here is the almost tongue-in-cheek attitude that the midwives have towards Pharaoh and this evil decree. He wants them to commit murder. They refuse to obey it. And their excuse is a jab at the Egyptians. Do you kind of get in here that the midwives are saying, oh, the, the Egyptian women, you're frail and fragile, but you know, by the time we get there, they're already done. Like the, the Hebrew women are just that much better than you. Like that's kind of the sense that you get from this. I kind of wonder how did Pharaoh respond? Wasn't well because, well, the next step is we'll see, uh, it's to do the same thing. His third solution is just more selective murder, but this time it's not the Hebrew midwives that he's commissioning. Now it's all of the Egyptians. If you see a baby boy born, chuck him in the Nile. That's, that's the plan. Verse, verse 22, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. So Pharaoh thought he had a good idea and he didn't want to give up on it. After all, if you eliminate all the male children, their ability to keep multiplying is virtually eliminated. But it would seem thinking about the context of the whole book, that this, this measure wasn't a permanent, always do this kind of measure, because when Moses led the people out of Egypt, it's unlikely that he's the only male, right? There, there would have been more boys. So maybe this was a measure for a time. But regardless, Pharaoh resorted to a brutal, evil tactic to reduce a population, to keep it in check, and it just emphasizes the need for God's judgment. Because the people of Israel were starting to cry out under this oppression. Forced into slavery. Now their children, the boys are being killed. By the decree of the ruling family. Things are set in place for the birth. Now listen to this. The birth of a deliverer who would be spared from the murderous intentions of an evil king. Now, does that not sound like our Christmas narratives or what? It's pointing to Jesus, isn't it? It's hinting at Moses will be a deliverer, a type of Messiah. Jesus would be the fullest Messiah, the one that would deliver us from the true, true evil, true sin, true death. So, Pharaoh thought he had a solution to a problem, but really the problem was with Pharaoh. God had a solution to the Pharaoh problem. Verses 15 through 20. I don't think we need to reread this. This is the, the midwives again. This is a question we're faced with. If God is good, why does evil exist? Why do bad things happen to good people? How do we respond to that? It's a painful question. People are hurt by it. Often it comes from those that have been hurt by the church. We see the evils in our day. Abortion being one of them. But so much more. And we ask... Where is God in the midst of this? Why is God allowing bad things to happen to good people? Or the innocent to suffer? Where is God? Now here's the thing that Exodus 1 reveals to us. Again, God is not explicitly mentioned other than that the midwives feared Him. God is with His people. 
God is with his people no matter what. They are fruitful. They are multiplying. They are fulfilling the command that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden. That is reflective of God's blessing them in their current location. And as the oppression started to ramp up, God blessed them more and they multiplied more. Slavery was not enough to curb the population growth. In fact, it amplified it because God was with them. God was watching over them. If God is willing to send a temporary deliverance through Shifra and Pua, what will God do as a more permanent measure is the, is the question that comes up in the first chapter. The midwives were a temporary solution to a bigger problem. What will God do? Obviously, we know the story of Moses is coming. We'll get into that in the coming weeks. But the question that the book of Exodus tries to answer as a whole is that. What will God do more permanently than what he's already done? What is the ultimate problem? What is the ultimate solution? Notice that the story does not start with Moses as the deliverer. And again, think about this. If this is Moses writing the book, he's not starting with his origin story in chapter 1. He's starting with the problem that happened even before he was born. This book is not about Moses versus Pharaoh. It's not even about the nation of Israel versus that evil king. Rather, the battle, it appears, is between God and Pharaoh. This king is defying God's plans. He is oppressing God's people, and God has blessed Israel, and as they multiplied, this king did not see the blessings that the people of Israel could bring to the Egyptians, but rather he saw a threat to his power. God would teach this king and Egypt a lesson that they would not soon forget because God does not forget his people. The original text was written for an original audience, for the people of Israel as they were in the midst of their exodus journey, one or two generations removed from the events described here in chapter 1. They were not yet in the promised land. And the generation who left Egypt proved unfaithful, as we know from the remainder of the book. They were not permitted to enter. They were dying off. Their story needed to be passed along, and so Moses wrote it down and shared the details of what would be codified into the Old Testament. This would be part of the primary scriptures, part of the books of the law how God wants His people to be. And generations to follow would be raised, learning to value what God values based on what God reveals in this book. It would be according to these scriptures that Mary and Joseph would try to raise their child, would abide by the customs and traditions set forth in this story. The festivals that commemorated events in the Exodus story would form a framework for Jesus' own and what was celebrated on Good Friday comes out of what happened in the Exodus story. So far in the book of Exodus, what points to Jesus? It's the need for a deliverer, the need for a redeemer. The people of God were under a form of persecution and I don't think any of us would dare say that what we experience is as bad as the slavery of what Egypt would have, or Israel would have experienced in Egypt. But at the same time, I think more and more of us are beginning to acknowledge that further persecution is not just a distinct possibility, but it's a probability. We need a Savior to deliver us from the hand of the enemy. For Israel, it was Pharaoh and his hard heart. We know that ultimately the enemy is the devil and his schemes are against the things of God. It is not a stretch to imagine that the devil was at work trying to influence and tempt this king with his beliefs, with his idols, with his sorcerers. The devil would tempt Jesus to commit sin too. But Jesus would remain faithful, a true, a pure, and spotless lamb. Another theme that comes up in this book. Undefiled by sin and shame. So let's pay careful attention as we go through in the coming weeks. 
to see how this book foreshadows Jesus. How it hints at His coming and what His mission ultimately will be. Namely, the deliverance of God's people from sin and death. And from that understanding, we are better equipped to see how God wants us to view these scriptures for how we live our lives today. Israel needed a deliverer, and so too do we. Jesus delivers us from the ultimate enemy, sin and death. All we need is to repent of our sins, receive Jesus and his atoning sacrifice on the cross, believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, and we too will be saved. That's the recipe for salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I encourage you. Read ahead. Dive into the book of Exodus. Get ahead of me. By all means, do that. Check out the context. Remember, it's connected to Genesis. Do these things. You'll get a richer, fuller understanding of what's going on as we work our way through these scriptures. But for now, let's close this message in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and for your love. I thank you for what you have done, not just in our lives, but Father, through history. And the fact that These stories were recorded for us and passed down. And I pray that we would understand more fully what you have in store for our lives through these stories. Help us to understand what is meant for us, for our education, for our understanding, and for our practice. And I pray, Father, that you would bless us this day and help us to ponder these things in our hearts and in our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll ask you to stand with us as we sing rain.